I come to you today with a word in my belly, a word that the Lord has been burning in my heart. As a matter of fact, every morning I'm waking up and I'm just hearing the Lord uh, sing to me about this word. He's saying all aboard, blow the trumpet in Zion. It's time to wake up the sleepers. It's time for Zion to put on her strength. And we have had a titanic shift in the world, even as war has broken out in Israel and everyone is talking about it, everyone is prophesying about it. There has been a shift in the church. And actually this shift has happened in the spirit long before it happened in the natural. But I am here to bring a wake up call. And the wake up call is this, all aboard, all aboard. I hear the Lord saying, it's time for the worshipers to gather and to get on the worship. The times of us just being in the presence of the Lord, worshiping, going to church, uh, enjoying our life in the prosperity of what, of the things that we have in America, in, in the rich modern church, in the contemporary modern church, that time is coming to a close. The church age is actually coming to a close. And, you know, many of us are, we are thinking about the rapture. We're thinking about, uh, and that is a wonderful thing to think of and to be prepared and write eternity on your hearts. This is so important. But I want to tell you that beyond the rapture of the church or beyond the catching away, some people don't even believe in that, and that's okay. I'm not sure eschatology is a preference. Uh, it's like my mom says, it's like noses. Every, the opinions on eschatology are like noses. Everybody's got one. Everybody's got one, an opinion on eschatology. Everybody has a belief system. And you know what? I'm not 100% sure what is right. I know what I feel in my heart, what I've been taught as from a, as a child. And I believe that. I still believe that. But you know what? I could be wrong. All I know is I want to be ready. All aboard. I hear the Lord saying, all aboard. It's time to board the worship. When the church age is over, we're immediately going into something called the kingdom age. And it's going to be a journey to get from one place to the other. Uh, whether the journey is that we're going to go to the rapture um, uh, or we're or we're going to be here for tribulation, whatever it is, it's a journey. And God's it is going to be a war. God is preparing his bride for war. And I'm here to sound the alarm. I have a burning word and a fiery passion in my belly for revival and transformation in the church. And it's time to wake up the warrior worshipers within us. We've been on a spiritual journey, but it's time to shift our course. Just like the Titanic, there is a Titanic shift that has happened on the earth. And the Titanic is a representation of the megachurch. And I want to tell you today that the megachurch is sinking. It's sinking in the ocean. It hit a wall because the church age is on its way out. But many are unaware. They are intoxicated by the cares of this world. They are comfortable on the pleasure cruise that has been the church. But the Titanic of the church cruise ship and the pleasure cruise it's sinking, y'all. And the people are drunk on the cares of the world. The people don't even realize that the, the shift has happened. And many are going to perish because they're not jumping off into the lifeboat and understanding that the shift is happening. They're still standing on the deck of the Titanic while the fiddler is fiddling and they're singing their contemporary worship songs. I'm telling you, a shift has happened, a titanic shift. And the shift is we are, God is done with the pleasure cruise mentality of the church, the country club mentality. It's been over for a long time. The old wine skin is done. We revere what God has done in the past, but it's time to shift into the new. The Lord is calling all aboard the worship. Ecclesiastes 3, 8 says it like this. There's a time to love, a time to hate, a time to war, and a time of peace. We've been in a time of peace for many, many years, but I'm telling you, the time for war has come. 
We're in the midst of this Titanic shift and it's time to recognize it. It's time for us to step into Daniel in 1132 said it like this. We are called to do great exploits. It's time for us to be strong and do those great exploits. Those great exploits are talking about the end time. We are in for an adventure. We are in for uh, an expedition of glory, and we must be prepared for what God has for us. There's a great danger in our midst to those who are spiritually blind to what time it is. The sons of Issachar and the tribes of Israel were the sons or were the tribe that understand the times and seasons. And it is so imperative that we understand what time, what where, where we are on the time clock to eternity. And we know it's almost midnight, but y'all midnight's not the end. Midnight is the beginning of a new day. You see, once the rapture happens or whatever that you say in eschatology that's going to happen, which we don't know for sure, but after that, there's going to be a thousand year reign. But before that, there's going to be a war and we are in this war. We are uh, supposed to get on the warship right now and the warship is taking us to our destination. One of the things we have to do as we get all aboard, as I hear God saying all aboard, and he's saying this, all hands on deck, all hands on deck. And it's time for us to put away the patriarchy, the case system, the elite and the uh, the elite people in leadership and the lower decks of the people in the pews. God says it's time for his people, his body, one and all to get up and take up their take up their calling, to understand how to use their giftings, to understand that a supernatural power is available to, to them. But before the Lord can use us, it's time for us to unite as one. And we are no longer divided by the artificial hierarchies where the, the, uh, gifts and the callings are just for an elite class, but it's time for the whole body of Christ to rise up and to get on deck, all hands on deck, the worship. And what I hear the Lord saying is before we take up our, our weapons on this worship, he has us on deck to clean up the ship because this vessel has got to be clean. And I'm talking about this vessel, right? My vessel, your vessel, your temple. What is the condition of your temple getting ready for war? And before we pick up our weapons, I hear the Lord saying it's time to repent, restore, and redeem the time that we have wasted on the cruise ship of complacency. It's time for us to get up with an urgency. And instead of getting out our swords, which we have had weapons in our hands in the body of Christ and not known how to use them properly, and we have injured one another. You know, there's a saying, hurt people, hurt people. And many on the ship, the Titanic, were injured by friendly fire. And it's God said it's time to stop being messy. It's stop being, time to stop being messy with one another, but it's time to restore all. It's time for us to get our brothers and sisters who have fallen by the wayside and have maybe even just gotten drunk on the cares of the world, it's time for us to go get them and say, it's time for you to get on board this worship with me. And the Lord said, before we pick up our weapons of war, that he wants us to have a mop and a bucket, a broom and a dustpan. Maybe some of us need to get down on our knees in prayer and in worship and make sure that we are in the presence of the Lord, like Isaiah in, in uh, chapter six, verse one, where he said, I saw the Lord and he was high and lifted up and his train filled the temple. And he saw the angels uh, saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God almighty who was and is and is to come. It's time for us to get in the presence of the Lord and get cleaned up. Like, like Isaiah said, woe is me for I am a man of unclean lips from a people of unclean lips. Lips. It is time for us to get the coals from the altar and cleanse our lips and have our speech ready for war, to have our countenance and our lifestyle ready for war. We are a bride. Let me give you a, a, a clue of what's happening on this ship. 
We're not fighting while we're on this ship. This is a ship, a transportation ship, and it's taking us to our destiny. And our destiny is a wedding. We're on a worship on our way to a wedding. Let's talk about it. Our assignment is to clean up our ship, to clean up our vessel, to make sure that our uniform is clean. You know, when you see these uh, TV shows when um, or the movies when uh, the, the captain comes aboard the ship to inspect everybody's uniform, their, their uh, buttons must be shiny and their shoes must be clean. Doesn't matter what their job is. They have got to look ship shape and God is asking his bride to be ship shape for this coming battle that we're about to go into. See, the journey is about the destination and our assignment is to clean the ship. This this is ship is taking us to a place that our enemy does not want to us to arrive safely. It's important to know that the enemy isn't fighting us from another ship, but the enemy is in the water. You ever heard the spirit of Leviathan? Leviathan was a sea monster that was a leg, less legendary in ancient times. This was well known in biblical times when the Bible Bible was written. And this Leviathan uh, would, a sea monster would hang out not far from the shore and it would attack the, the vessels that were laden down with treasure, that maybe the vessels that weren't going as fast as the others, they were lagging behind because they, ha- they had so much weight on them because they had gold and treasures and silver and, and heavy objects or maybe many soldiers or sailors that were weighing it down. So what, what, what is the enemy? This Leviathan wants to plunder God's treasure. And what is God's treasure? It's souls. You are God's treasure. He said, you are my, you are my priceless possession. We are to be possessed of God in this aid, in this day and age. We can't play anymore. We have to, we, we have to be possessed of him. He's possessing us. We've got to give him all access to us if we want all access to him. He wants us to wound one another. He wants us to jump ship and give up and be discouraged. The Leviathan spirit is one that chokes. Uh, It causes people uh, not to have good breathing. It wraps itself in coils around and squeezes its victim to death. And the enemy wants to silence your voice. The enemy wants you to give up. He wants you to be discouraged. But nobody can jump ship but you. Nobody can make you. Nobody can make you quit. The only person that can keep you from this destination of the marriage supper of the lamb of your wedding is you. But the enemy wants you to jump ship so you jump in the water and he can choke you out. He wants us to injure one another. You know, our wounds have hurt many, but it's time again to not uh, be messy with our gifts and our callings and our strength and our authority. But there's another saying, healed people, heal people. And a hurting world is waiting for us to get in ship shape. A hurting world is waiting for us to throw over our nets and to call those from the north, south, and east and west that have never heard of him to tell them about the glorious wedding and the marriage supper that's awaiting us. And we can allow God to heal and deliver and set free. It's time for us to prepare for inspection. The captain of the host is coming for a clean bride. When he comes, he's going to inspect us. Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Have you been washed in the blood, as the song says? Is your armor cleansed and polished? Do you have your war clothes on? Are you dressed in the full armor of God? Do you know how to worship him in spirit and truth? Are you wielding that uh, sword of the spirit? And are you holding up the shield of faith? This is the question that God is asking us. Let me tell you something else about this ship. This ship is propelled by fire. If you've watched the Titanic movie, which I think most people have, those old time vessels, those giant cruise ships, they had a um, furnace in the belly of the ship and people were taking coal and shoveling it day and night in the boiler room, keeping that 
keeping that uh, fire burning. And I'm telling you today that if you want to be propelled and you want your ship to be going forward into the new, into the war, into that place of eternity with the Lord, you have to have a fire in your belly. What is the fire? The fire is prayer. The fire is worship. That coal from the altar when we get into the presence of the Lord, that is the coal that will propel this ship. You will find a fire in the at the throne room. There is a fire that cannot be quenched, but we have got to keep our furnace room fiery. We have got to stay in the presence of the Lord to keep our fire burning. If you have no fire, you're going to be stuck like Chuck. If you have no fire, you're not going anywhere in this king in this season. It's time to get a fiery prayer life. To visit the throne room, to cleanse your life in the glory and the presence of the Lord, to bring the fire of heaven to earth. Another way you can keep your fire is through praise. Praise is our weapon. Praise and worship have the power to set us free. Just ask Paul and Silas. Praisers are never prisoners. Ask Jehoshaphat. Worshipers are always winners. When we lead our day, when we lead our our, in the midst of the trials and tribulations of this war, if we lift up our voice in praise and worship to the Lord, we will win this fight. We can clean the ship deck and we can worship at the same time. We can, we can go through a battle. We can go through a storm and we can worship at the same time. Don't get it twisted. We were never meant to be sailors. We are not sailors. We are just here temporarily on this warship to get us to the destination. What's the destination? I told you before, it's the wedding supper. I want to tell you a story about a, a, a minister who really meant a lot to me in, in my life. And I, I sat at his feet uh, for many, many hours when he would come through uh, our town a couple times a year. He was a great missionary named Brother Bert Clendenin. And he was in World War II and he was fighting in some of these islands in Japan and almost starved to death. Uh, the soldiers were cut off without rations. And, you know, it was a very difficult time uh, that he had during the war. But as they boarded the vessel to come home from this, from the South Pacific, as they boarded this vessel, you know, they got to eat, they got to get cleaned up, they got to have a shower. It felt so awesome to be uh, where p other people were speaking English, you know, and, and to be with, uh, he had so many friends who had died. It was a period of grief and it was a period of um, healing because they had been so, they had suffered much in the war. But he said they pulled up to the New York Harbor. And as they were preparing, you know, getting their uniforms on and, you know, he was from Texas. So there was nobody there to meet him. But he was like, well, you know, I'm just going to be getting on a train to go to Texas and nobody's going to be there to meet me. And he was just expecting to get off that ship without fanfare. But he said as they pulled up and they got up on deck and they were all hands on deck. And as they pulled up to that harbor, he could hear the music playing. He could hear the band playing. He could hear the people screaming. He could see the confetti in the air. And as he walked off that ship after fighting hard and being starved and almost dying and seeing many of his friends die, giving his heart to the Lord in the foxhole. He came off that ship and as he came down that ramp, he said the band, the bands were playing, people were singing, they were waving the American flags, there was confetti in the air and ticker tape parades as they went down the street and girls were grabbing him and kissing him that he'd never seen in his life and people were saying, thank you, thank you, you're our hero. I'm going to tell you that we have a welcome. That's even greater than that coming when we disembark off that worship and we go toward our marriage supper. We're going to have a supper like you've never had in your life. And the one who's going to be serving us is Yeshua himself. He's going to put on the apron and he's going to serve those. And he's going to say, you're my hero. You made it. But that's not the end. After the supper, we're never sailors. We are the Calvary. You know, I grew up on a ranch. 
riding horses and I love to ride horses. I showed horses all throughout my young life. You know what? We're going to be going into the stables and picking out our white horse. Yeshua is going to welcome us off that ship and he's going to serve us a great supper. He's going to give us a new name and he's going to give us a robe of white and he's going to give us a white stone with our name carved in it, a new name that no man knows but him. And we have an assignment. We are going to battle. It's time to get battle ready, y'all. We're going to go to a battle where the fight is fixed and a war that we are destined to win. Our king has never lost a battle and he never will. He's preparing a warship right now with an army of worshipers. Will you come aboard? I hear the Lord saying all aboard. Let me tell you what Revelation uh, says about this ultimate battle that we're going to. Are you ready for this? Is uh, Revelation 19 verse nine. And he said unto me, right, blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the lamb. And he said unto me, these are the true sayings of God. This is really going to happen, y'all. I want to get your mindset ready for the battle and for our thousand year plan. It doesn't end at the rapture. There's so much more. And God said, ride, get yourself ready. Verse 10. And I fell at his feet to worship him. What is Revelation full of? Worship and war. Worship and war. This is the season that we are going into worship and war. And he said unto me, see thou do it not. I am thy fellow servant and thy brethren that have testimony of Jesus. Worship God for the testimony of Yeshua is the spirit of prophecy. It's time for the prophets to arise. It's time to wake up, O sleeper. Get your gifts. Learn how to utilize your spiritual gifts. You learn how to wield your spiritual weapons. Clean up your temple. Get your garment ready. And I saw heaven open. This is verse 11. And behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness, righteousness he does judge and make war there's a judgment coming are you righteous are you in right standing with the lord we are going those who are ready are going to make war with the lord his eyes were as a flame of fire and on his head were many crowns and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself and he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood and his name is called the word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him. That's us, right? That's me. I'm there. <laughs> Are you going? They followed him up on white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. It's time to get your, it's time to get yourself cleaned up and ready. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, and with it he should smite the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of almighty God. Let me talk about that judging with a rule of iron. Right now, we know that there are principalities and powers that rule over the wicked world that we live in. They've been defeated by, by, by our Lord when he at the cross, but they're still in operation. There's coming a day, this day, the great day of the Lord where they're all going to lose their jobs and they're all going to die in this fight. But you know who's going to replace them? Who's going to rule and reign in their stead? Who's going to divide up the nations like uh, like it did at the Tower of Babel? Who, who is going to rule? It's going to be us. It's going to be you and I. So how you live your life right now and how you prepare, how much of the word of God do you have in you? How much of his spirit is in you? See, it's not enough to be spirit filled right now. It's being spirit filled is static saying, God, fill me. But it's about being spirit led right now. Being spirit led, led by the spirit. So we will rule with him. We will rule and reign for a thousand years. So I'm going to ask you right now, what's your thousand year plan? After you get off the worship, have you planned beyond that? Because he told us, in the book of Revelation, what's going to happen for a reason. So we would prepare and make ourselves ready for battle.
And it says in verse 16, and he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So come, the spirit and the bride say come. All aboard the warship, all hands on deck. It's time to rise to worship and to prepare for his soon coming. The ultimate battle is coming and we're going to be in it. So my dear brothers and sisters, let me summarize this. We are in a season of great change. Are you shifting with the tide? It's a time to unite. It's a time to be a warrior worshiper. It's time to break down the walls of division. It's time to repent for our complacency. It's time to embrace the power of praise and worship because praisers are never prisoners and worshipers are always winners. We are battle ready and our victory is assured if we follow after our king. The time to be revived, the time for war is now. So I challenge each one of you to step into this new season with passion and purpose. We've got to get off the Titanic. It's sinking, sinking. And it's time for us to get on the worship. I'm going to conclude with this. A few years ago, I've, ne I've never shared this uh, online, but a few years ago, before we had all this capability to go online, actually it was about 20 years ago, I was taking a group of people to Germany and I was fasting and praying and asking the Lord for instructions for my assignment. And during this time of deep consecration, I had a dream and it's marked me forever. In the dream, I was taken into a building that had about a, a, a two double doors that were at least 15 stories high, these ancient doors. Of course, I immediately thought of lift up your head, <laughs> you everlasting doors, lift up your head, um, you know, for the king of glory shall come in. And I felt these ancient doors open. And as I walked in, it was a dank, dark, giant, almost like an old castle. But it was one giant room that was about 15 to 20 stories high. And there were some people there to greet me. And I didn't know any of them. And then also my cousin Marla was with me, which was odd. But she was with me and she was kind of like, I guess my assistant or my armor bearer or something. I kind of felt like she was there to help me. And they showed me into a smaller room and I went in this smaller room and they gave me this beautifully wrapped gift. It was about, you know, maybe four feet uh, long and two feet wide. And it was wrapped beautifully. And um, I they stood me in front of this three way mirror and they said, open your gift. And I opened the gift that was so beautifully wrapped. It looked like I'm nothing I'd ever seen before. And when I opened the gift, it was a burlap coat and it looked like it was made out of a feed sack. And I didn't know if they were like playing a joke on me, like a gag gift or what, but it didn't matter because I felt that that burlap coat was so precious and I put it on in front of that three-way mirror. And when I put it on, it fit me like a glove. I'm a fashion major. I was a fashion major in college, I have a fashion degree. So I know what a, a well-made garment, when it looked like a, a, an old burlap sack, but when I put it on my body and put my arms in the sleeves, it fit me like a couture garment. And when I looked down at the sleeves that were so beautiful with the bell sleeves and all the trim and the details on it, I saw that the burlap, was actually gold and it was long with a train and I they took me back into the big room and I said oh thank you so much for this beautiful garment what is this for like what is my assignment if I'm wearing this beautiful garment and they said don't you know and they walked out of the room and I realized I'm wearing the garment of praise well, I begin to praise. I begin to lift my hands. This is what I do. 
I praise, I begin to lift up the Lord and I'm going to cut to the chase because there was so much happening in my spirit during this time. But I begin to jump and leap and praise, dance and spin and twirl. And before I knew it, I was flying around the room. I was spinning. I was twirling. I was summers. I was like in Cirque du Soleil. And it was like the power of the garment of praise or the mantle that I put on that had elevated me and given me the lift. As I got higher and higher in this room, and it almost seemed like the ceiling went to eternity, as I was flying by and as I was worshiping, caught up in the joy and the praise and the atmosphere of the presence of the Lord, I began to see weapons on the wall. These were not ordinary weapons. These were old weapons like the old battle axes and the old um uh, sickles and the the balls that have the spikes on them and all of these old weaponry from like the medieval times. And the Lord said, grab a sword. So I grabbed a sword and I began to wield it like an expert. And I was like, yes, I felt so strong. I felt so powerful in God. And as I ascended higher, all of a sudden I saw like a loft, like a, like a little hay loft or a loft. <laughs> I'm from the barn, uh, barn world. So it was like a loft and I saw all of these little yellow lights and I began to go toward it. And as I saw the little yellow lights, they were beady eyes of little furry demons that were about two feet tall, covered in fur, had a leather armor, like suit on with yellow eyes so evil and wicked looking, almost like vermin. And I felt so powerful and strong with my sword in my hand. I landed in that loft and they scattered and they went through a hole in the wall. And I went after him and I stuck my sword through that hole and I poked my head through the, through the hole. And inside that hole, I could see what had been a beautiful, magnificent church, but it was in ruins. There were cobwebs. It was dark. The demons had infested it. And I could see them scurrying and scattering and like, don't come in here. They had this look on their face. Like they were terrified that I was going to come through that hole. But I realized I can't do this by myself. I need someone to come with me. So I fly out of the loft area and I go back down to the middle of the giant room. And the only person I saw was my cousin Marla, who was standing at those giant doors as if she was leaving. And I said, Marla, where did everybody go? And she just kind of went like this. So I ran toward her. And I said, Marla, there's a church. There's a church in there. We've got to go back. There's a church. And my heart was so urgently I'm crying for someone to come with me. Let's take that church back. Let's clean it up. Let's get this church glorious again. This is the glorious church that God is calling us to. This is my assignment. So as she was had the door partially open and she started to walk out the door, I followed her out and I was going, Marla, there's a church. People, there are a church. Where are the people? And I could see Marla and she was walking out onto a dock. And she was leading me to where the people were. And I saw this dock and on the dock, there were all manners of beautiful boats and uh, just uh, sea dews and all kinds of th things for fun, like water skiing boats and fishing boats and leisure boats and yachts. And I, I walked up to Marla and I said, where did everybody go? And she just kind of looked like this, like they're all on these boats. And I was standing on the edge of the dock screaming, wait, don't go. There's a church. There's a church. Tears streaming down my face. And one by one, these speed boats and the yachts and all of these begin to launch off the dock. And I'm standing there by myself crying. There's a church. There's a church. We have to save the church. I thought that was going to be for my assignment in Germany, but, but it wasn't. I come to realize, as I've never forgotten that image and the imagery and the feeling that I had, that that was for a future time. And I believe that time is now. I believe there are many in the church world that are in cobwebs and the old wineskin. There are many that are in places that are filled with demonic rulers 
uh, that have infested churches where people have been hurt and people have been wounded and bruised and the demonic powers have come in. And it's time for us to take it back. It's time for us to be healers. It's time for us to grow up in God and say, we're taking back this church. We're getting off the yacht. We're getting off the, the speed boats. We're getting off the, the leisure, this leisure world. And we're coming to fight and take this church back, to put on the garment of praise, to put on our mantles, to go to war and battle for a church that's worth it. See, it's not about just if I make it to heaven and if I make it to the marriage supper, I'm going. But who am I going to bring with me? Will we restore the battle scarred church in cobwebs? Will we, we restore that mighty glorious church? That's what he's coming back for a joyous church full of strength. So I say, let's come together united in prayer and worship. Let's cleanse the church that worship and prepare for the great battle that's ahead. The captain is coming to inspect. The king is coming y'all. And he's inspecting the deck. He sent his worship to gather up his worshipers to take them to his marriage supper, to prepare us for that end time battle. So we will go out like a mighty Calvary. Are you ready? Are you willing to be a part of this army of worshipers that has paid the price to live a holy life? He's raising up those who say yes. He's raising up those who say, I'm coming aboard. This is not a time to take selfies aboard this ship. This is a time for us to get clean and go to war. So let's arise, O Zion. O church of the living God, let us prepare for the time for revival. The time for us to raise up, to clean up, and to go to war is now. Thank you for listening. I pray this is a blessing to you. If it is, share it with somebody else that will be blessed. We thank you and God bless you. Shalom.